Do you have a child or grandchild in sports right now? Now, youth sports has been traditionally known as an avenue for exercise and socialization, but in recent years, youth sports has taken on a larger, more critical role of being a pathway for young athletes to gain a college scholarship. Yet, the costs appear to be very high for players and their families. Rick Eckstein, a sociology professor at Villanova University, has authored the book, How College Athletics Are Hurting Girls Sports, The Pay-to-Play Pipeline. Correspondent Khalil Ekelona sits down with him to discuss his findings. Rick Eckstein, author and professor at Villanova University, thank you for stopping by New Mexico PBS Studios. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Khalil. So, so tell me, what sparked your interest in researching youth sports? Well, a couple things. Uh, mostly as, as a college professor teaching students who are roughly 18 to 21, I noticed over the years more and more of them were coming to class on crutches. They were coming to class with concussion headbands, and they tended to be the athletes and they tended to be the female athletes. So that got me interested in what was going on and there seemed to be a, a massive increase, just anecdotally, in my experience, mm -hmm. of uh, young women especially having these uh, overuse injuries. As a youth sports coach myself, I got to see firsthand uh, the, the lure of doing things that weren't necessarily in the best interest of people physically or mentally, but just the, the idea that somehow specializing in a sport and playing it year-round would lead to a coveted college scholarship. And uh, yeah. I wanted to see what the, what the reality was about that. Okay, well your book, it focuses on pay-to-play youth sports. What does that mean? It means that if you want to participate in the youth sports system, and especially if you have some notion of getting yourself a college scholarship or an admissions advantage to an elite university, you have to get involved in this commercial enterprise okay. that is geared around what we call showcase tournaments. And you can't just play recreational soccer or recreational sports anymore. You can't just play for your school anymore because the college recruiters who have pressures of their own coming from the, the bosses of higher education, uh, they don't go to the schools anymore. They don't go to the playgrounds anymore, except in a couple of sports, a couple of uh, male sports. Mostly they go to these pay-to-play tournaments where teams uh, come from all over the country. People are paying $5,000 a year just to be on a team, and then thousands more to attend these tournaments. There could be 12, 14, 16 tournaments a year, and you have to have money to be able to get into the system. And so people who don't can't, and what few scholarships are out there, they don't have access to them. Well, how did all this get started? Well, it, there's always been scholarships, of course, for men, mm -hmm. but in the, in the wake of Title IX in the late 70s, and really it, it kicked in more in the 90s and the, and the 2000s, is there are well, many more opportunities at the college level started opening up uh, for women to participate in intercollegiate athletics. And different sports have uh, what I call different intercollegiate footprints. And those sports which developed the, the largest footprints and the most significant footprints tended to then uh, create in its wake uh, a youth sports system that was highly commercialized and try to take advantage of these expanding opportunities but also exaggerated these opportunities and colleges and universities have done nothing to to uh, tamp down that exaggeration in fact they're probably uh, most responsible for encouraging the misunderstanding of scholarships and uh, admissions advantages okay wow well in youth sports, you and I were talking before we started taping, and you've been a recreational coach, I've been a recreational coach, but there's also, also these camps that you mentioned. What is, what is the main difference between the two? Well, there's, uh, you know, there's now different levels, more and more levels all the time of these uh, youth sports opportunities, starting from, let's say, recreational mm -hmm. and township programs now, which are mostly recreational, they've started forming their own travel uh, components. Sometimes even within the travel component they'll have an elite travel component and that's been that's been going on but that's not where the real growth is. Most of it is from a, a more private system outside of townships and cities where companies have literally started and they call themselves not-for-profit but they're not mm. and they have marketed themselves as being a better way to navigate the youth sports terrain so that okay. you can get that coveted scholarship. Let's face it, higher education, I don't know how old your kids are, but um, it's, it's, it's expensive. It, it's expensive. Yeah. Ironically, one of the reasons it's so expensive is that schools have been spending more and more money on intercollegiate athletics mm -hmm. as opposed to instruction and research. Okay. So someone has to pay for that, and that's interestingly in a, in a kind of circle, circular way, cause people to look for more money to help pay for college. So these sports camps and these leagues and these travel teams cost a lot of money. What effect does that have on families who are just simply trying to get a scholarship for their young daughter? Well, they think that it's going to really grease the skids 
and helping them get these scholarships. Mm. Now, what happens is that they're more or less sold a bill of goods because they don't know how restricted the opportunities actually are. They've magnified the existence of these scholarships, the size of these scholarships, how much of an admissions, admissions advantage they might get to an elite university. So they go in with, with a completely, complete befuddlement about what's going on. All right. And, and so they become very ripe for manipulation and a, and a coach or, or a trainer or a league or a team or a camp will say, look, this is the one. Look, we've got kids who came to this camp and now they're playing a, a Division I sport or now they're in the Ivy League doing this. And sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. In the, in the book, there's a little section and I, I went through and I traced a lot of uh, these, these camps and teams and leagues who claim to have players in certain places and I couldn't find a lot of them. Okay. So a lot of it is just marketing and trying to sell your product and differentiate your product from someone else's product, which is pretty much the same thing. Yeah, and, and, and team parents and families who are left out just completely, there, there's no, there's very little chance for them to get their daughter into a school on a scholarship. Right, in, in non-revenue sports, and for, for women and girls, it's, all the sports are non-revenue sports. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for men and for boys, there's still an opportunity in basketball and football to kind of circumvent the pipeline. There's still recruiting that goes on in playgrounds and at high schools. Yeah. So high school football, uh, whether you like it or not, is sort of class neutral, anyone who, can go to high school, can play on the football team. There's a subsidy there yeah. from the school, but that doesn't exist in the non-revenue sports. You have to pay to play if you want to play in college. There's, there's ways around it, but it's, it's very, very difficult. Okay, okay. Now, we were talking about the rising costs of going, going to college and university. Is this a direct correlation? Is that affecting youth sports in these camps? Yeah, my argument in the book is that it's actually causal mm. and that it's the policies of higher education and putting more and more emphasis on intercollegiate athletics as a way to, to uh, cultivate their brand. Uh, they're less and less interested in instruction and research because that's everyone does it. Yeah. So if they can come up with a visible team, if they can pour money into famous coaches, uh, get, get themselves a championship, uh, win a league, maybe someone the goes to the pros, appearance. that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, they think that that's going to propel them into some next level of higher education where uh, Professors will flock there, students will flock there, money will flock there. They really believe this. Now, there's no empirical evidence to support it, mm. but it is the conventional wisdom in higher education that using sports, highly visible sports, is the way to best market and promote your brand. I understand. I, I remember watching uh, the NCAA tournament as a young high school student and being interested in some of the schools that were locally close by but were succeeding. So let me ask you another question. Now, as far as the universities and these pay-to-play programs, we understand families are investing a lot of money into these pay-to-play programs for their child to get a scholarship. Now, will they receive, is there a match? Sometimes, what I'm asking is, possibly will the family spend more in these programs than the scholarship assistance they'll receive potentially? Generally, yes. Wow. Generally, far more. There are a couple of sports, and I didn't intend the book to be this way, but some people have already taken it. There are a few sports like rowing, and uh, ice hockey for females, where you can get a pretty good return on your investment okay. because the intercollegiate footprint is expanding okay. faster than the supply of athletes. So they're throwing money around at hockey players and uh, rowers, but that's gonna end. And another thing about hockey and rowing is that they're incredibly expensive. So in order to get into that system and get a return on your investment, you've got to have the capital yeah. up front in order to make that investment, and many families don't. Okay. Now, in your book, you claim that the NCAA is kind of a promoter and regulator of this system. What, what supports that argument? Well, they, what they, it's, it's more promotion by uh, ignoring it. They, mm. they sort of enable it. They, don't, they haven't done anything to, uh, to dissuade these pipelines from forming. Because in their mind, as long as the recruitment is done fairly and as long as at, at the college level, the competition is not biased and it hasn't been jaded by uh, some unfair advantage, they don't really care. Mm -hmm. And they would say, and, and, I, and I, don't, I don't necessarily blame them for this, let the colleges and universities decide what their policies want to be. And if they want to stop spending millions of dollars a year recruiting at these showcase tournaments and go out and recruit at high schools, well, that's their business. Okay. And I would encourage colleges and universities to do that okay. because it's fair and it would give people an opportunity to play college sports, which is a lot of fun at times. And why should you have to be rich 
or, yeah. in, or mostly white and suburban in order to participate in college sports. I mean, you look at the demographics of, of women's college sports, and it does not look like the United States, mm. and it doesn't even look like higher education mm. in the United States. It's very white, it's very upper middle class, and it's very suburban. And is that due to the corporatization of, of higher education? It, it, that feeds these commercial pipelines, which are pay-to-play pipelines and then very restrictive. So that's why I argue that colleges and universities would have to change their policies and that might trickle down okay. and affect the youth sports pipelines. Okay, now let me ask you one final question. And we, we talk about, you have testimonials from players and families talking about the sacrifices that they make and what they have to go through in order to earn a scholarship. Now, but the scholarship system isn't the same. You were saying that there's only few sports with fully guaranteed scholarships. What is it in this scholarship system that we as the general public don't know? Well, we don't know how many scholarships are available per team uh, per, div uh, per NCAA level, Division mm. I, Division II, Division III. The NCAA puts maximum numbers of what are, what are called full scholarship equivalencies. That's the, that's the equivalent of a full, full tuition, room, board, books. Gotcha. So certain teams are allotted ma a maximum number of scholarships. So women's soccer, for instance, is allotted 14 maximum scholarships, mm -hmm. which they then can divide up. But no school is required to give 14. So okay. many give 12 or 10 or 8, and they still divide them up among an average uh, Division I soccer squad is about 27 or 28 people. That's a baseball really squad, you tell this to your, uh, to your nephew, right? A baseball squad is usually 35, 38 people and a maximum of 10 and a half full scholarships that can, that can wow. divide it up among sometimes 30 or 40 people. So people are getting a 10% scholarship, and that does not compensate for the money that was put and invested up front yeah by these families. So we don't know that in colleges and universities and the NCAA, they're very protective of this information. And by not having this information, it's encouraging families to make uh, really poor decisions yeah. because the, the money sit, certainly isn't there. It's, and the, the average amount that you would get for, say, a soccer scholarship is about $15,000 a year. Wow. If they had more of this information, perhaps they can make wiser decisions for the future for their kids. I would hope so. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Doc, Mr. Eckstein, thank you so much for coming on the thank show. Thank you, Khalil. Author of How College Athletics Are Hurting Girls Sports, The Pay-to-Pay -pay Pipeline. Thank you. Thank you.